Well, hey there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Publish Like a Motherfucker number nine. My name is Stephen Kozniewski, and I've got a special guest with me, which we will introduce in a moment, but I see we have zero viewers, so maybe we'll give it a second to let some folks come in here. Um, okay, we got one viewer, and viewer, whoever you are, can you please make a comment in the comment section so that we can see if that's working right now? as people come in and out. I'm thinking I might know who this viewer is, but I'm not sure. Do, 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 do. And Kaylee Marie Edwards says, hello. Well, hello, Kaylee. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so that's good. That seems like we have all of our technical stuff working. Um, so thanks to everybody who's tuning in. Um, sorry if we had to go into a different link than you were looking for, but hopefully you're able to find it. I just shared it around, you know, Twitter, Facebook, and all that good stuff. And hopefully we'll even, might even get some organic watches. Let's see. So, like I said, my name is Stephen Kosniewski. I am an author of horror and science fiction. Um, and this is published like a motherfucker, course number nine. The Life Audio Aquatic with Steve and Matt, too. Uh, that was the best I could do. I was trying to come up with some way to make it rhyme with Zisu, but I, it, it wasn't working out. So it's fine. But tonight we will be talking about audiobooks to some extent, um, which is a very interesting subject. And with that in mind, let me introduce our special guest tonight, who is a podcaster on multiple podcasts, an audio engineer, again on multiple podcasts, a cover designer, and the author of such books as Horrors Untold, which is a multi-book series, Edge of Twilight, Melancholia, and Baggage. Let me introduce you to the one, the only, Mr. Matt Wildeson. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. How are you doing tonight, Matt? I'm doing pretty good, pretty good. It's not freezing for a change, so my office is not frigid. I'm very happy I, about that. I noticed that. Um, so we are both, uh, unfortunately for me, I'm not going to put those words in your mouth, but unfortunately for me, we are both in uh, York County, Pennsylvania. I'm a recent transplant coming from the distant climes of Cumberland County, Pennsylvania. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we've been having a really cold snap, which I saw our good friend, um, which, you know, what you do when you have a cold snap is you look out the window to confirm that you have a cold snap. <laughs> um, which our uh, good friend, uh, Chris Enterline, I saw he was complaining about getting his uh, first electric bill, I believe, ever. But yeah, oh, Chris. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Those well, things, um, they never get easier. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I, I don't know if you know this, Matt, but I am the new slumlord over uh, Chris's estate. <laughs> I've I've been told in in no uncertain terms by his friends what a terrible landlord I am. <laughs> so it's probably uh, probably my fault that uh, I didn't warn him about the uh, electric bill. But uh, that's fine. He'll uh, he'll get to know about that. It's a learning uh, experience. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, for the last month to six weeks, it's been freezing. I haven't seen the snow recede even an inch. And uh, just today, I think it hit like 54 or something like that. So yeah, a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so what I would like to see, and I see a few people uh, are watching us now, awesome. um, which is great. It's always better to do this than to talk into the void. Now, that being said, uh, if you are not here live, you may be watching this in 2041 on YouTube, if YouTube is still a thing, you know, 20 odd years from now. Um, if you are, you will not be able to comment. However, if you are watching this live, please comment in the comments section like Tom Duffy just did. And Tom Duffy says few people. Uh, I guess he's saying a few people are watching. Thanks, Tom. Yep. Thanks, Glad Tom. to have you. Um, so if you uh, have a question, don't worry if it is I mean, if it's about tonight's subject, great. If not, if you just want to know about something completely divergent, that's fine too. I don't know how long we have Matt for. Matt, are you confirmed for an hour? Or are we just? I, I'm good for it? as long as you need me. Right. Okay, great. So that's what I like to hear. I don't want to hold anybody forever, but 
Matt will be here as long as you've got questions. So if you want to talk about other topics, um, and Alexander Bailey, Alex from <laughs> Iowa, I should say, says, I'm always watching. I'm always watching. <laughs> which is a little bit disconcerting, considering he also has my name tattooed on him. This is getting to be a little bit weird now, Alex. I wish I hadn't said I live in York County. But he has what? <laughs> I, I that was some trivia I did not know about. You oh you didn't know about the tattoo? I did not. No. Okay. Yeah. No. I that is uh, if I die, people are going to remember two things, which is splatterpunk loser, name tattooed on a guy's arm in Iowa. That's those are the things. Remember, remember. me. <laughs> yeah, like the giant uh, Bender robot. Right? <laughs> it's big, but sometimes I worry that it might be too big. Too big. <laughs> are they remembering me or are they remembering the statue? I'll always remember you, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, now, uh, that being said, wow, uh, people are taking advantage of it. So, yeah, before we even get into our subject. Tom, All right, Duffy, yeah. Tom Duffy has a question for our special guest. And Tom asks, my question will be, what is Matt's favorite dish to cook? Oh, my God. There are so many. <laughs> um, I love I, I am a man who loves pizza and um, I will make a homemade pizza if I have the if I have the gusto. Sometimes I don't like to because it's just, you know, waiting for dough to proof and everything. But, you know, the way the world's getting lately, it's uh, better to figure out how to do this stuff on your own. <laughs> I think the last time I ordered a pizza, I was like looking at like 30 bucks for like two of them. And I was like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's before tip and delivery fee and everything. Yeah. I love pasta, Italian pizza, pasta, all that stuff. Yeah. Now, do you have a, um, a, a wood burning stove or, or a pizza? What's it called? I, a pizza oven. I don't, I do not have a pizza oven. I've been wanting to get one of those, um, I don't, I forget what brand it's called, but it's like a little tabletop one that's like propane gas and you can put it in there. Okay. Know. Yeah, that'd be cool. I don't, I don't, I would think for a household, there'd be no need for the full oven experience. You'd probably never make more than one pizza at a time. <laughs> so yeah, that would make sense. And uh, Alex from Iowa says, I have causes, Keen's and San Giovanni signatures tattooed on my arm. Indeed. Well, why the why the hell don't you have my signature? The, I was gonna say, the other arm should have like Willis and yeah. You know, these and these people come around, they call you their friends and stuff, and then they don't have your name on their arm. I, uh, you know, you 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 make it when you know some some guy out in Iowa has his <laughs> your name tattooed on his arm. Exactly. That's how you know. Uh, Tom Duffy says, Alex, I'll see you at Mando Con. I'm. Guessing that's run by our good friend uh, Armand Rosamilia. Um, I did not know mm. that he had a convention. I did not. So uh, I also did not get an invite to be a special guest at Armand's convention, uh, which seems, you know, pretty typical from from his end there. So, oh boy, we're not even getting into. We're not even getting <laughs> through all the introductions. We're getting questions, but this is what I like. Yeah. I would much rather. So what I was going to say when we were in the middle of the introduction there. Um, I would much rather talk to what you guys are interested in for the live broadcast. Um, I always say this when I'm doing uh, panels at conventions and stuff. Uh, we're writers. We could easily talk at you for an hour. Yeah. So it's much better to uh, you know find out what you want to hear and that kind of thing. So, well, Alex said, yes, it is. It's a small thing that takes place at his house. Oh. Um, all right. Well, as long as you don't get tattoos of Armand and uh, Frank, Mr. Frank and uh, yeah, uh, I, Shea I Wilburn. I yeah, claim, you, I, can't, I claim the realty on your left arm. Yeah, Wilderson needs to be next. I'm next. So, uh, Kaylee, our good friend Kaylee Marie Edwards, uh, who, I mean, a uh, person I've never heard of before named Kaylee, uh, says, Matt, you say the way the world's going. It's better learning how to do things like pizza. Are you implying the zombie apocalypse is nigh? I mean, I'm not going to deny it. It, it. it possibly could be. I'm, I'm rolling the dice for like a kaiju type end of the world scenario, just because I mm. think that would be really interesting. But you know, if we get zombies, whatever, I'll take it. What about um, enormous zombies? 
that would like kaiju sized zombies. That would be, you know what? Let's do that. Yeah. Let's load that dice and make sure it falls on kaiju sized zombies. I'd be down with that. That'd be interesting. <laughs> I, I would wonder what would be the circumstances surrounding that. I'm already, I guess I already know what we're writing next. The only problem is, would there be enough brains to feed said zombies that size? Yeah, I guess you'd have to like pop all the brains out. Of, like you'd have to have like a farm, like a brain farm, and like pop all the brains out into one trough or something. I'm smelling collaboration, <laughs> dude. Brain farm just sounds. That's a great title right there on its own. And then it's just like people synthetically growing brains to feed giant kaiju like gods that are zombies. Now there was something similar. Um... Uh, a PG Mentoring wrote called Tank Bread, where the it was like bread, you know, bread being human brains, bread in a tank, like a axolotl tank from. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they actually cloned uh, people as tank bread for the the zombie apocalypse, um, but I, I, they were not gigantic, as I recall. Hmm. Alex from iOS. Holy shit, Godzilla is a zombie, mind blown. I mean, kind of technically, in certain circumstances, was. <laughs> yeah. The, the Shin Godzilla. Well, no, there was... Okay, now, I don't want to go down that road. I don't want to nerd out over Godzilla for like an hour and a half. I'll just... <laughs> I'll leave it in... The, there was one continuity where that possibly happened, and I'm going to leave it in. <laughs> um. Yeah, well, yeah, Shin Godzilla, he kept evolving, but you're saying the implication was that he was evolving out of the corpse of the... Yeah, he, he was supposed to be like the corpses of the people that suffered in Hiroshima. But there was also... An, I mean, I guess since we're opening this jar, I might as well... <laughs> um, there was also another movie. It was like Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters, All Out Attack. That's the actual official title of the film. Yes. Um, Godzilla was essentially created from the ghosts of the people that died in Hiroshima. Okay. So there you go. Both, are, both are very reasonable um, explanations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Matt says, or rather Tom says, I'm not following the two comments, but the one comment says, Matt, I believe you were talking about a box set of your short story collection. I am up for that. Oh, okay. Then he's saying and he misspelled that. Yeah. Okay. okay. So he's saying, Matt, I believe you were talking about a box set of your short story collection. That would be Horrors Untold. Yes. Yeah. I, I've been contemplating doing a hardcover on the bus, which would collect three. Uh, like right now, I'm up to four volumes. Uh, this would collect volumes one through three of Horrors Untold in this giant hardback on the bus. I've been kicking around the idea. The only problem I'm not. 100% keen on is that uh, cost for the reader because that is going to be fairly expensive to produce. Yeah. And uh, I would like to go outside of Amazon because I'm not necessarily impressed with their hardcovers. They kind of just look like classroom textbooks. And I, I'm a man who fancies a dust jacket. Mm -hmm. So, you know, call me posh if you will. But, uh, you know, if I'm going to go out, I'm going to go the whole way, you know. Well, I just uh, saw that Barnes and Noble, just when I released my last book in the fall, I know Barnes and Noble is doing paperbacks now. And yeah, I had talked to our good friend uh, Tommy Clark about that uh, when I was kicking around the idea about the hardcover, and he 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 strongly urged me go to Barnes and Noble <laughs> and screw like screw Amazon. And I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm tempted, man. I really am. It's an option. Uh, Bill Fisher assures you, Matt, you're posh. And Tom also had to throw in a uh, pun here and says, I think you said you you weren't 100% keen about something. No. And Tom said, is anybody 100% keen as in Brian Keen? I don't think about... anybody is. I don't even think Brian Keen is 100% keen some of the no. time. So. No. He does not in real life live up to the expectations. I can no, tell there's you There's a lot of that thing going on. <laughs> <laughs> So um, this is good. I'm, I'm glad we're having some uh, audience participation. Me too. Um, I did want to say, Matt, that I am um, I'm a little bit sorry because we have kind of this funny relationship 
that I guess a lot of public figures have. And you're going to say, oh, me, a public figure. I already know you're going to say it. But um, I feel like I know a lot more about you than you know about me, which is not like a not like in an ugly sense. But like I have listened to you on podcasts. Um, I've listened to you on the Ghost Riders podcast for the last, I want to say, year and a half, two years. Mm hmm. And the horror show before that, and the uh, is it Grindcast? Yep. Um, uh, on the side, still going. So I always feel like every time that I encounter you, I'm like, oh hey, it's my buddy Matt, who I know everything he thinks about the Avengers and Godzilla and everything else. And I feel like, oh, oh, but we're just like, you know. No, you, you're you're fair in saying that. I you do probably know a little bit more about me than I know about you, because I mean, we've been around each other. And we've spoken, but we haven't really. Uh, I think the first time we've got to be like buddy buddy ish was when we had you on the Ghost Riders, and we got to actually just kind of talk shop for a little bit. But you know, other than that, it's been just kind of through, you know, Facebook IMs and stuff like that. Yeah. So. So, do you find that's like a? Uh, how do you navigate the relationships like that? I mean, you, you've done so many podcasts, like do you encounter a lot of people that you're like, Oh, I know them from Twitter, but then like you see them in real life. I mean, I, I haven't come across that yet just because I haven't done conventions. Um, uh, and that I'm, I'm hoping to uh, finally pop my convention cherry at author con in April. Uh, as long as everything seems okay, at least to, a point where I feel at least comfortable with it. Uh, you know, when, when COVID and everything started, I was very, I was pretty militant about it. I was almost as militant as Brian was when I was like, I'm staying inside. I'm only going out to get things when I need them. And I don't care who says what or what they believe I should be doing. This is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Deal with it. And I, I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't going to any conventions. You know, there was a few online things that I did and that was about it. So, you know, I've met a lot of people on Twitter and become friends with quite a few of them. And I, I feel like it's going to be one of those things when I, when I finally get to meet these people, you know, like, like Alex, for example, and Alex, if I see you in April and you don't have my name tattooed on your arm, there, there's, there's going to be hell to pay. Um, but so I feel much like, pressure on this poor kid, right? No now. pressure, no pressure. Um, <laughs> But I, I feel like when I finally do get to meet some of these people, it's it's not going to feel awkward because I've, I've been talking and creating a rapport with them for so long. And I've gotten to know them, you know, even, some of them more on a personal level because, um, you know, you, you end up getting that close knit group of people where you can come to them when you're like, you know, oh, I, I'm about ready to quit this shit because I'm tired of it. And I, I don't think I'm even good enough. And you have that support group. And, you know, I, I can't wait to finally meet all the people in that support group. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. And that strikes me probably uh, weekly, if not in daily. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I throw a Band-Aid over every fissure that appears <laughs> on a <laughs> weekly, sometimes other, you know, every other daily basis. I'm just like, yeah, well, you know. Throw a little bit of mortar over that crack and hope it doesn't reopen again. We'll see. <laughs> so I do see two questions in the chat, and we'll get to those in a second. Away. But I, I did want to ask, because we, we haven't had that, um, that I don't want to say personal relationship, but maybe that's the right word. Like, we, we have that weird kind of relationship that only exists maybe in this modern time. Yeah. Um, but I've always wondered, so... Uh, the cooking, so are, are you currently a, a chef? Is that how you make your money? No, not anymore. I, I was I was a chef pre-COVID when that hit. Um, the place that I, the employer that I was working with basically laid everyone off. And, you know, we were told that we were going to be brought back. And some were brought back. People that were cheaper. Let's, let's just put it this way. I'm not going to call out any names. I'm not going to mention businesses or anything. But I had gotten um, a job afterwards doing basically what I do now with uh, podcasts and I do, you know, audio editing and I do video editing for a company that does like training videos and uh, gra uh, website design and stuff like that, graphic work. So it, it was like right in this wheelhouse of stuff that skills I was developing on the side that I never even knew I was going to actually use to make money with. Yeah. <laughs> and it just happened to plop into my lap. So 
I got lucky. So did you like go to Votech or was it like School of Hard Knocks? Or, like how do you how does one I, become I, a, a chef? I taught myself everything about the like about audio, video editing. Okay, well, um, I, I got that. You said about the audio, you had to learn that. I meant about the cooking. Oh, cooking? Uh no, I didn't go to Votech either. I I I self-taught myself that and I walked into a kitchen one day and I was like you know, please, sir, I would like to work in your fancy establishment. And I don't know what it was. Maybe the moons were right that day, you know, but the guy that eventually I became good friends with, his name was Chef Tyler. Uh, he doesn't live in PA anymore, but, you know, we, we talk every now and then. Um, he was just like, yeah, what the hell? You start Monday, kid, you know, and that's how it started. And I fucked everything up. Oh, yeah. I, was, I was the worst cook in the world when I started. I, I thought I was going to be fired in a week and they kept giving me chances and I got better and I, you know, I put the time in, bought shit tons of textbooks and just read and read and read and practiced. That's interesting. I'll tell you the next million dollar idea. I don't remember if I, I, I think I've pitched this to summer. But I don't think I've ever pitched it to you, but what you guys need to do, I'll even back myself out of it. Cause I don't know what value I'd bring to this, but you do a cookbook, right? And it's like, um, like, you have a little story and it's like Dracula's, you know, cold human blood or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you have the recipe on the left is like nine ounces, human blood, Clamato and whatever. And then on the right, it's, you know, like gazpacho and like, how do you actually right. make it's it? like the translation? <laughs> yeah. Which is like, kind of like what I always thought that she did with Vicky beautiful. But oh, I, yeah, yeah. I always wanted to see like a whole horror uh, cookbook. See, we're we're on a similar wavelength here with that because I had this idea where um, we we get people that we know of in our community that would want to do something like this that you know have their secret recipes because I I know Keen's got that chili recipe that he claims is the best chili in the, in all of the land or whatever. But I, I've had this chili. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> Because God knows he might be watching on it or not. No, he's sleeping. Um, so oh, yeah, it's it's almost eight fifteen on the East Coast. He's surely dead asleep. <laughs> but my idea was is that we get the people together and they have their actual recipes, Clamato, which get printed gross. in the book. But um, before that, you write this this little sonnet, like you find on every website where it's just like, oh, you know this. This grits and gravy came from my old great grandpappy Myrtle. You know, it's like yeah. you have this whole story, but it's like a it's a horror story as to how this legendary dish came to be, and then you you know have the dish afterwards. So I, I've been thinking yep. about that too. I'm like a horror cookbook could sell in today's market because everybody's doing those like Disney themed cookbooks and yeah, all it's that kind of stuff. like a Grady Hendrix kind of thing. We sell it to Quirk. Uh, like I think it's you know I, I think it can happen. Yeah. All right, so I don't want to ignore the uh, chat for too long. Okay. But yeah, yeah. Bill Fisher, when you mentioned having a Fisher weekly or daily, said Fisher or Fisher <laughs> asking for a friend. Oh, Both. Oh, oh. Both. Oh, oh. <laughs> All right. Um, and Alex wants to know if having the, the tattoo of Matt Wilderson in Sharpie will count. If the uh, Sharpie ink is being penetrated through your skin via needle, yes, it counts. <laughs> oh, he's not backing down, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> he even tried to give you an out. Okay. Um, and Alex had a real question. So when we were talking about uh, the Horrors Untold um, uh, box set, he says, Matt, would you have interest in trying to sell it to a limited edition publisher such as Thunderstorm or Earthling Publications? That's your, oh. your Horrors Untold box set. I'll have to take a look at Earthling Publications. I have not sent anything their way before. Um, you know, I've been in talks with Paul for a couple different projects that I have going. And I think short stories, unless you're somebody at a higher level, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm still very, very new in all of this. I don't really have that big of a name attached to me. Like short story collections are extremely hard to sell. And, um, you know, I wouldn't really even waste Paul's time with that because he is so busy as it is that, you know, I, I don't want to plop something like, here you go, Paul. Here, You want to look at these stories? <laughs> he does just like, you know, that's that's cool, kid. But I <laughs> come back in like 10 years, maybe. 
I, I have to say, I have seen some very lovely things that he's done. That was actually um, Alex, Alex and I were simpatico about that. There's something that um, that Jans has. Uh, I want to say it's like the uh, horror westerns or Dust Devils mm -hmm. uh, theme. I mean, he's done some of them. And um, Paul, we're talking about Paul Goblish from uh, Thunderstorm Books. Uh, for those of you tuning in, um, he'll he'll have a set of these books um, and they'll be like, kind of like tan, maybe like uh, almost kind of like a leather bound tome, like an old fashioned. So like you can get each book, but then you can also get the set and they clearly all, you know, go together then. Oh, that's really cool. That was the same thing I was thinking. I was like, Oh, a horrors untold set, maybe with a different, you know, thing, a different uh, spine or series of spines, you know? Yeah. Um, so Anne asked, well, we'll see about this. I am jumping around a little bit. I'm not, I, I, did, I didn't miss <laughs> you there. Edward Lee recipe. <laughs> so would we include an Edward Lee recipe in the, in the uh, cookbook? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm, I'm a person that normally likes to say, I, I don't want to, I would never put anybody out of any project. Cause that's just who I am. I don't like telling people no especially when it comes from a creative thing. I'm just scared to know <laughs> what an Ed Lee recipe would be. <laughs> I, I don't know Ed Lee personally, but I feel like he is like a SpaghettiOs and Easy Mac kind of guy like me. I don't I know mean, that maybe, he... maybe he'd be that person we get the uh, the cocktail weenies in, you know, like Pillsbury Crescent Roll things, you know. Maybe we'll, you know, like the pig in the maybe. Box type thing. Or maybe we're both way off, and he's going to be like, "Oh yeah, caught oh, yeah. on, uh, you know, served <laughs> under." What's that horrible French bird that you have to like drown the bird in its own juices or whatever? Oh god, the... uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> it's like a sin against God to eat it. Yeah, uh, I cannot remember what that is called. But yeah, maybe we'll be surprised. Maybe Edward Lee will have a great. Uh, great recipe but he just shows up he's like here's some coco van you know yeah, you know, you yeah. Try that? okay so tom asks uh do you feel being on these podcasts that there's an added pressure to being a voice that's an interesting question that's a very good question um i feel like i, I maybe for maybe when i was on the horror show there might have been a little bit more of one and and, and for ghost writers podcast i would say you know for certain things because we we do every now and then get into writing topics that will de like delve a little bit deeper into your soul, <laughs> you know? And when I was, when I started on the horror show, I like a couple people reached out every now and then they're like, I, I like hearing you because I feel like you're that voice of the people that are just starting out. And it's interesting to hear like you figuring your way out through all of this stuff. And that did put some pressure at first because I was like, well, I don't want to, you know, I know I'm allowed to say something stupid and ask a dumb question because I'm figuring it out. But I'm like, I don't want to ask like every dumb question in the book. <laughs> like, I'd like to get something right every now and then. But uh, Grindcast, though, not so much. That show, I just, that show is just for fun. Mm -hmm. It's been for funsies for seven years. It doesn't get like a, a, a super massive ton of listeners like Ghost Riders or the horror show did, but it's, that show is my weekly getaway from all of the nonsense that goes on. And we have so much fun. You know, if no one's listening, if, if anybody in the chat has not listened to Grindcast, you are, you're, you're ruining your life. You really need to listen to it. Yeah. Yeah, you do. I can agree with that. Um, I, I apologize if I seem to check out there for a minute. The, the bird is called an Ortolan. Oh, okay. So you were looking it up. It was, <laughs> I was looking it up, and uh, there's a whole thing. You're supposed to catch it, drown it in brandy, force feed it. it it's just, it's a horrible way to treat any <laughs> animal. But apparently it's like a, uh, you know, a great dish. Can't say I've ever prepared one myself. <laughs> and, and especially in the, uh, you know, the step-by-step -step that you're going on. Well, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe combining those two things we know about Ed Lee. Maybe that would be an Ed Lee dish. Could be. Maybe it turns out he is this great gourmand, and also he loves the particularly, you know, insane dishes. Um, <laughs> so regarding the dishes, Alexander said, and Marble, I think I just threw up in my mouth a little at the thought of an Edward Lee recipe. 
unless Which, not unless yeah. he's like you know a grand gourmage like <laughs> yeah perhaps saucier of the sultan of saucier for all we know uh, I will no longer be the Iron Chef. I will now be the Zinc Saucier, <laughs> uh, which Anne enjoyed. And Tom said, "Any recipe from the pig or the house? No, God, no." Yeah, <laughs> I can agree with that. Oh, and Alexander says, "Cause the brown books you were talking about were the Douglas Western series. Paul has also done it with Jan's Shadow Size series or Band Sick Dark, Dark Walker series, to name a few. Yeah, the uh, the the Shadow Size was the ones I saw when I, I was in Phoenix. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so that's good. Well, maybe one day when I become, you know, John Urban Sick and Jonathan Jan's levels, maybe he'll pu publish some horizontal specials for me. Yeah, exactly. You'll never, you'll never know. Uh, Tom says, if anybody in the chat hasn't listened to Grindcast, you're a donkey's ass. Okay. <laughs> I agree, Tom. Thank you. I was going to say, he took it to a level we were trying to, you know, keep the quiet part quiet. <laughs> and Alex says, uh, Matt, because of Grindcast, every time I see you drink from your Sonic mug, I'm waiting to hear the Sega button. Sega! There you go. Well done. <laughs> Well done. And Anne's work is done here because she grossed out uh, Alexander, <laughs> well I think. Well yeah, done. well done. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit, and we, we kind of have, so even if you had to go right now, um, I'd be like, okay, we kind of talked about the subject a little bit. Um, but I kind of wanted to talk about audiobooks. Yeah. And uh, when I was talking to you, Matt, about, um, you know, what to do with this, uh, you know, what topic to cover this week, um, you said, that's fine, but I've never released an audiobook. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, well, I think that's okay, because, you know, I can kind of talk about that, that side of the business a little bit. But I'm really interested in, like you said, you're, you know, a self-taught, you know, audio engineer. So there's a bunch of stuff where... I essentially press a button and I go, make me an audio book. And then it just like happens. Yeah. And I'd like to know how the sausage is made. So like normally when I do these things, I, I can talk about all this, you know, how the sausage is made with, oh, here's how you write a book. Here's how you get a Twitter feed. Here's how you do that. Um, but I don't know anything about the audio engineering side. of it. Um, okay. But Tom's got a question first. No, oh, okay. Tom says, okay, serious question. When you wanted to write, how did you do it in terms of just going for it? Especially when you had the podcast with a bunch of other writers. So he's probably talking about um, when I was on Horror, uh, horror Show. Horror Show. And, yeah. Um, I mean, being around Brian and Mary was kind of, it, it, it kind of pushed my ass to just do things. Because, you know, when, when I was starting out and I was listening to Brian talk about how, you know, I just wrote and, you know, like his first book became like a really popular thing. And, it, you know, he but it wouldn't happen unless he did it. And I, I told him ideas of books that I had in my head and he would just tell me, like, those are really good ideas. And, you know, after he read some of my first stuff and said, you know, you could you could make money in this industry if you work at it. And I just I had to. At that point, I was like, there's there's no reason to not give this a shot. And there's no reason for anybody to not give it a shot. If you really want to do that, you know, there is nothing in this world that's telling you that you can't try to write a book. It's only it's it's it boils down to determination and essentially time management. In a sense, you need to be your own boss and you need to be accountable for yourself to sit down and put your ass in a chair open up your laptop and just start writing whatever it is you have in your head. You know, the editing process, the whole marketing thing, that's something, that's a road you can test out when you get there, but just get the book done first. And then, you know, you, you can see where it goes from there. And that, that's how it is. Sometimes, you know, I've, there's been people I'd say within the past year that have put out their first book and it has skyrocketed. And, you know, they are just their their names are everywhere. And I'm sure, you know, some of you listening know some of the people that I'm talking about. I'm not going to mention everybody by name, but you know who I'm referencing. And that wouldn't have happened if they didn't sit down and do it. 
Yeah. So, you know, don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it because those people that tell you that are assholes, honestly. So that's fair. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll do it if you're not going to. I mean, Haley Piper, she's up for uh, yeah a, a best a best first novel for um, Stokers. When I saw that, I had to go look it up because I was like, what? How can this possibly be? But it was absolutely your first novel. Yep. And uh, Eric LaRocca, I'd have to double check. I don't, I don't know if um, things have gotten worse since last we spoke was his first thing, but that blew the fuck up this yeah, year. Yeah, if it wasn't his first, it was, it was in a series of like you know first couple books at least, I, I believe. Yeah. So yeah, but that and that's the thing. It it'll not always be your first book. It could be your ninetieth book, but there's a chance that any one of them you print could blow up one day. You know, it's worth a shot. If you really want it, just go for it. And I'll tell you one thing. I, I, I guess I probably say this a lot, but there is such a difference between being a brand new published author and being an aspiring author. I don't mm -hmm. mean in a shitty way. I just mean the physical capacity to be able to hold in your hand. I just I remember when Rainy Dear Jones came out. And all these years that I was like, oh, I'm going to be there someday and I'm going to do that someday. And I, I can literally just walk up to somebody like, I wrote this book. It's nice to meet you. You're a hero of mine, but I physically produced something and you can now hold on to that. I mean, mm -hmm. it opens up doors. You can talk to people. You, can, you can't you can sell nothing. Right. Um, and your first book may be terrible. Most people's first books are terrible unless you've got a bunch in the trunk, in which case it's your actual first book that's terrible. Right. But, you know, even if you put out that terrible first book and then, you know, you find your way in the community and, you, you know, I've heard this time and time again from people. I've heard people say like, oh, I regret self-publishing that first book or whatever. But it's also like that got them through the door that got them through the whole. I don't yeah. know if I can ever be published kind of thing. Well, and I, and I want to say, like, I self-published a lot so far. I've only sold one. Uh, novella so far and that was the death's head press i have the first page of the contract in a frame over here on my debt on my side desk um i i was very proud of the day that that happened but i'm also seriously proud of every single book that i self-publish because honestly where we're at right now i feel like self-publishing shouldn't be a thing that's looked down upon at all you know it, it it's an easier way to get a book out there yeah to an extent, if you know everything that you're doing to get that book finished and looking well, that people want to buy it, <laughs> but it's still publishing. I, I, you know, when I see, and I've seen that on Twitter a lot lately, people just be like, oh, self-published books, eh, pff, you know, we don't need that stuff. And it's like, I don't, I, I don't know where you get this other than just maybe you're pissed off that <laughs> somebody's putting the book out there and they're not doing it through a contract. I don't know. It. I don't know. People have to shit on everything. They really do. They I, I really don't know. Do. Especially if it's West Southern, they're going to find a way to shit on you. Yeah. I, <sighs> for some reason, I have never, I, and Wes, Wes is a good friend of mine. Yeah. I have never seen anyone who attracts the crazies. Yeah. Like he does. And he's a great guy. And he's a very. <sighs> He, he's a very nice person, and that's how I don't understand <laughs> where he gets all these really crazy people giving him shit all the time. I'm just like, why would we, why why attack him? Like of all people. <laughs> oh, Bill's having his uh, Britney moment. He says, "Leave Wes alone." <laughs> I'm assuming he's having a Britney moment. Um, Tom said, "It's good to know that Brian pushed your ass uh, when we were talking about getting stuff out there." And seriously, you are great. Oh, thank you, Tom. Um, and Summer Cannon says, I love you guys for being so inspirational and supportive. We love you too, Summer. Yeah, we really do. And uh, if you haven't been watching from the beginning, Summer, there was a million dollar idea from the very beginning. So mm -hmm. you're going to have to start over. Um, okay, so before we even really got into the audiobook discussion, Bill's on topic. Bill says, is it best to drop an audiobook at the same time as the rest of your releases or wait in a hope to get multiple sales from a single reader? Hmm. 
So I mean, I, I feel like that just comes down to preference, honestly. And, you know. Yeah. Um, I guess what Bill's talking about here, and maybe you can clarify if we don't um, address exactly what you're saying. Yeah. But uh, sometimes when you, all right, maybe it's all the time on Amazon. If you buy an audio book, you get a discount on the Kindle. Okay. So I guess he's saying when you have a release, so you drop baggage. I, I, it's, that was a funny way to put it because the name of the book is baggage. <laughs> You drop the novel baggage. Um, obviously, you're putting it out in Kindle. Yeah. Most people put out Kindle and paperback at the same time. Yes. If we were to put out Kindle paperback and audiobook at the same time, would that make a difference to sales? I think no. I think the answer is no. Because I think they're only going to buy it in one format. Although there is that thing on Amazon where if you buy it an audiobook, you get the Kindle at a significant discount. Yeah, I think I would have to agree with you on that too, because you're I mean, it's great to have all those different options, obviously, at the same time. But I feel like if you have people that are strictly audiobook, they're just gonna wait for the audiobook, they're not gonna buy the other formats. So Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I, I like I've I've personally never done that, and I know one person is not a you know, make a chart, a statistic, but I, I've never been like, oh, I bought the audiobook. I better get the Kindle. Like, maybe if it's something I loved, I would buy it on audiobook and have a paperback to have. But um, yeah, I mean, I've I've seen I've seen a lot more people do the whole. You know, I've either listened to the well, and this is for me. I've bought the Kindle and I really liked it, and I wanted a copy of the physical are you going to do any signed editions yeah. that that question comes around a, a good bit. So I imagine you would probably maybe get an extra sale out of audiobook listeners like that. Possibly again, I have not, I've not put out an audiobook of my own yet. I've been thinking. Yeah. And I've never done it. Um, all I've never dropped them all at once. It's, it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, I've always dropped the Kindle and the paperback first and then gotten a narrator. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I couldn't swear one way or the other. I would imagine doing all three of those at the same time, though, would be a humongous pain in the ass. Yeah. Because that, that's, you know, that's a lot of herding cats to get all of that done at the same time. <laughs> Find your narrator, have mm -hmm. them turn it over in a timely fashion. Yeah. It might be doable. I'll have to think mm -hmm. about it for the next one. Tom asks, what's something that you really want to write, but you've had a hard time doing? That's a good question. Hmm. Well, um, a good friend of ours, I mean, maybe a, a better friend of Steve's more than mine. I, I know of the man uh, through, again, like Steve, through messaging. I haven't got to talk to him personally, but um, Steve wrote a book with this gentleman. And uh, we'll just we'll leave it at that. Maybe he knows who it is. I don't, I don't know. Um, I I was trying to start a uh, a grim dark style like dark fantasy novel, and uh, it was a genre I never really got into before. And I asked for some beta readers, and Steve's friend was gracious to be like, I would love to look over your beta read, and uh, he came back with some you know really good notes. And I really appreciate it. And I said, you know, you and you and Steve are two people that I really look up to, you know, and I'm really glad you're working on this book series together. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you guys are doing this clickers thing. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's a privilege to talk to you. And then he didn't reply back, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, um, that was, that's uh, and it's one thing I'm planning on getting into after I'm done this current novel that I'm working on, which was another thing that I, I wasn't sure if I was going to be all right. Cause this, this current thing I'm doing is um, maybe if you follow me on Twitter, you've heard me talk about it a couple of times. I, I titled it onion town. It's based off of a small town. That's uh, up near it's up in New York state called onion town, but it's basically just a small gathering of like trailer park homes. And it, it has like a folklore legend attached to it, but this is a real place. 
In real life, yes. Okay. This is a real life thing. You can look it up on YouTube. There's actually videos documenting the place. Um, my version of it is that the town, the, the small trailer town itself is the first couple of rings of hell. And you're actually going to be going through Dante's Inferno based around a trailer park. <laughs> and that's what I'm currently working on right now. But other than that, the grimdark thing, yes, I would love to get into that. I've been a huge Dark Souls fan since, you know, Demon Souls Inception. And I've always wanted to write a book in a universe such as that. But, you know, it'll be the next thing I try and tackle, I suppose. Well, that sounds great. I'm still trying to figure out who that person you were talking about was. I'll have to look up names because I'm, I'm, I'm not like trying to be cryptic. I'm completely blanking. And this is something that always happens to me. <laughs> I assume it's Stevie Coast, but uh, she's not. No, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bill says, okay. So but this is a uh, follow up to Bill's question about dropping the audiobook at the same time. Is that to make sure the book is successful before spending the money on an audio book? Um, now that's an interesting question, Bill, and uh, it's interesting that you bring that up. Um, we haven't really gotten into the nuts and bolts part of this discussion yet. Um, you do not necessarily have to spend any money on an audiobook. Um, I have not to date. Um, you have two choices basically, which is a royalty share and paying up front. Um, now, if you pay up front, uh, audiobook narrators are like anybody else. They're going to have a great range of uh, prices that they'll charge. And you'll usually get what you pay for. But I think on the crappy end, mm -hmm. you're going to be paying like $200 an hour, a, a published hour. And it can go up quite a bit from there. Like, I, I think you're... I, I don't want to quote a price at you, but I think you're looking at about $500 a, a published hour. So that would be something like if when you read the book out loud, it turns out to take 12 hours to read, like it would be a 12 hour long book yeah. on Audible, you'd pay 12 times 500. Yeah. Um, so that's outside of the range of most people. Um, I'm certainly not going to drop $6,000 on an audiobook, um, unless, you know, unless I feel like the, unless I feel like the narrator himself is a draw and people are going to listen more for the narrator than for me, which does occasionally happen. Like there are some narrators that people pick up, pick up their books, regardless of who the author is. Um, but anyway, all that being aside, most people are going to pick the royalty share option. And again, you can have a great range because there's people that are just trying to get into the audiobook narrating uh, field and they're quite good narrators and they are still taking royalty share because they don't know how much they're worth, essentially. And then you have people that are just kind of crummy and aren't worth anything and all they can get is royalty share. Mm -hmm. um, so I would not say that I've ever... I've occasionally had discussions with the narrators about like how popular do you think this book is going to be? And I've told them, you're not going to make any money off of this working with me. Like, right. Uh, you know, you may make your money back, but you're not going to make that $500 an hour or whatever you were charging for the full retail price. So you might want to go take one of those jobs instead of working with me. And they've always been like, no, 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 I believe in the book or, or you know, whatever. But um, primarily it's just that I want to get the book out and then I go back and worry about the audio book. I guess I've just never, uh, like, like Matt was talking about earlier, I've never had the wherewithal to put that all together. You know, it's like a months long process. You, you have a book together and it's formatted and it's ready to go. That can be published tonight. Mm -hmm. then I have to tack on two or three months to get the narrator to, together. It's a whole other right. animal. Uh, Alexander, I think, was guessing about who this person was. Willie, oh, Willie Young. Willie, I, don't, Willie. I don't know who that is. but I never heard of that. 
for the sake of for the sake of his uh, guess, I'll say you're correct, and you win. My last name is a tattoo on your left arm. Oh my god, he's back to that. Ah, <laughs> oh, so much pressure on this poor kid. Okay, Bill's got one that's going to obscure both of our faces. All right. While we're here, I've noticed that in what I've read, Kaz is more pulp while Matt is more flowery. Is that a rude term? No, I don't think that's a rude term necessarily. If so, I apologize, but is that because of your influences or is it just a comfort thing? Is that by design? Also, yes, I am drinking whiskey, LOL. Um, so he's asking about your prose style and where that comes right. from. Okay. Um, I'd say it's more, more of a comfort thing because I've – my reading journey – basically started with a lot of people's where it was it was like king essentially and i started with like scary stories books and goosebumps and all that crap and red king and quiet horror was kind of more of what i was accustomed to um you know growing up so that's kind of what i stuck with when my writing style when i, when I started writing stuff and i just feel not that not that i couldn't do extreme or pulp or the other styles i just I don't know. Like, even when I try to start something that is more visceral, it ends up being more quiet by the time I'm done. So I always just gravitate to just, well, might as well just stick with quiet <laughs> if that's where it's always going to end up leading anyway. So that's pretty much why I'm, I'm flowery, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I, uh, I'm taking into account that Bill's had something to drink. Um, <laughs> I never thought, uh, I know I've written some pulp type works, but I never really thought of my prose as pulpy. In fact, I've had people tell me, you use two big words uh, on yeah, the negative but... end. But on the positive end, I've had people say, you write like Neil Gaiman and shit. And I'm like, uh... so I don't know if either of those is true. I mean, that's um, not a bad compliment, cause. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, I don't think either of them are particularly bad but some people don't like when you use big words i guess um but i will say I, I think what he's getting at is that i don't use a lot of descriptors and um i don't try and set the scene and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and that is definitely um, a part of my personality because i remember when i came across my first editor she wanted me to tell you the color of the shirt of every character in a scene right to set a scene and i was like the scene is in the dialogue and the action and mm -hmm. you can infer the thoughts of the characters i'm not so much interested in the wallpaper on the room I, you know i i, right, I have right. always been more of a bare bones um i, I almost want to say like Hemingway kind of author uh but it's really just that I don't care about this I don't you know if they're sitting down at dinner is it important that somebody was having a kale salad I mean like maybe if no. that tells you something about their character right right but yeah no I I've I I don't tend to use that uh let's say lyrical uh language um and Alexander asks, I know you've both collaborated with people before, but who is your dream person to write with? Well, I'm talking with him right now. No. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not my dream. No, I'm just I'm kidding. <laughs> I would love to work with you at any point in time, but, um, you know, and, and I don't say this just because I like to um, name drop anything, but. I, I would, I, you know, ever, ever since I met Brian, cause, and I'll be straight up with you. When I first met Brian, I had no idea who the hell he was. Um, I was working in a comic book store here in York and the two owners that were there, they knew Brian, they were friends with Brian and they knew I was doing the podcast. And they're like, well, Hey, how about we see if Brian wants to do the show with you? And I was just like, oh, yeah, okay, sure. Because I just thought he was like this this local writer that like, you know, was somewhat popular, but, you know, he wasn't like who Brian was. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And I 
thought nothing of this. My co-hosts, on the other hand, they were prepared. They brought notes, the one dressed up in a suit, and I'm just there looking like a slob, and I'm just asking <laughs> these stupid fucking questions. And, you know, for some reason, we became friends from that. <laughs> and he had me on the horror show a couple of times. And then when I got to be on the show and I got to know him a little bit more personally, I was like, you know, I don't know if our styles would ever match. So it probably would be something that would never, ever happen. But I always I thought from that day, I was like, I would like to write a book with him because it would be to me, it would be in a, not only a learning experience, but a journey at the same time, because, you know, knowing Brian and, and, and Mary, Mary San Giovanni could attest to this more so than any of us probably could. Knowing Brian in itself is a journey. It is a, it is an adventure where every day you have no idea what the hell is going to happen, and all you can do is just bite down and you know enjoy the ride as, as long as you can. But yeah, I, I would say that I, I always thought of trying to do something with Brian would be pretty cool, you know. And, I, and a lot of people are like, oh, I'd, I'd love to write with King, and it's like, yeah, well, as far as I know, King only writes with uh, Chismar anymore, so I, I don't think he's gonna write with anybody else. <laughs> Straub 30 years ago. Yeah, Straub, yeah. Um, I'm not going to give you a real great answer to this question, Alex, but um, there's kind of two things that I think about with this question nowadays. Um, so, like, to answer to the question right off the bat, like, who would be great? Yeah, like Matt said, you know, for my career, somebody like Stephen King or Jonathan Mayberry would be great yeah. to collaborate with. Um, or who do I think is a genius that I would love to be involved with is like David Wong, uh, for instance. Um, but I'll tell you what, having been through several collaborations now and some you guys don't even know about and um, some that have been great, some that have been frankly terrible. Um, I want somebody who's easy to work with. Yeah, that's key who we have a shared goal, a shared style. Um, you know, I just want, I just want somebody who is not going to, that I'm not going to be like, you know, like when I, when I sit down to write nowadays, I'm like, I want to look at something that brings me joy. Like mm -hmm. who was that? Who was that lady that used to say that Marie Kondo? I think I'm so. Like, yeah. I want to write with joy. And sometimes I get into collaborations with these people. And like I said, it's it's nobody that any of you guys know about. And I'm, I look at it and I'm like, this doesn't bring me joy. This brings me great displeasure to look at this, you know, manuscript. So what I really want out of a collaborator is just someone who will like work with me. Like, yeah, like Copus or like Young, uh, you know. Um, so Bill liked my update to lyrical rather than flowery mm. he also says matt and san giovanni would be fantastic that'd be interesting well bill there is some manuscripts that have been in the works um we've gotten we, and we had announced that her and i were working on something before on um the ghost writers podcast it's been shelved currently because mary and and steve knows this too mary has a fairly huge project on her hands right now that she has to get through first before she comes back down to work with little old me. So, you know, it's, it, it's been planned. It's been talked about. And it's in the works. It's uh it's Dinotopia. You guys remember Dinotopia from the, 90s? yeah, I remember Dinotopia. Mary, Mary's rebooting that. That's. Yeah. I told her it's... a bit better. She rebooted Dino Riders, but I don't know. Oh, Dino Riders. That'd be good. <laughs> no, that's absolutely a lie. It's not that, but yeah, it is huge. Um, and Bill says that's a day one buy if you guys collaborate. Well, thank you, Bill. Alex says just throwing it out there. I'm easy to work with and pretty agreeable. All right, send me your pitch, Alex. <laughs> if it was me that you wanted to work with, if it's Matt, I don't know. He seems to have a bunch of prerequisites for you. <laughs> <laughs> So Bill says uh, clickers versus hematophages. And the reason I clicked on that one last is because um, Wiley Young and I have actually been, and I don't think we've talked to Mary about this, or maybe we did, but I, I still have to get Mary's um, 
say so, and then we have to pitch it to uh, Thunderstorm. But we have a pitch for Hematophages versus the Black Magpie. Oh, cool. So in the 1850s or whenever the Black Magpie, who is canonically said to have been in Pennsylvania, Mm -hmm. we have him go to Zarephath, Pennsylvania, and open the door and release the Hematophages. Nice. So we we have a pitch for Thunderstorms versus series, which is uh, Magpie versus Hematophages, or something like. So I, I don't know. We'll have to nail down the title, but uh, Clickers is not our property, but <laughs> <laughs> N- nor is Behind the Door. But I think we could get permission to use Behind the Door. Some people are less um, uh, specific about their uh, IP than others. <laughs> Bill also considers that a day one buy. Nice. And Alex says, I already I already has a magic a project with Matt in the works. Well, Alex, that teeters on, you know, you know what you know what you need to do. I don't need <laughs> God with this guy. <laughs> hey, I demand respect, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I guess this is to the Magpie versus Hematophages is insert the shut up and take my money gif. Okay. I'm sure it is because Alex doesn't buy my books. So I'm sure it's for yours. That's fucked up, man. <laughs> That's fucked up. And he wants you to collaborate with him. I know. He probably won't buy that one either. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, hour two. Hour two. Let's talk a little bit about our subject. Yeah. It's been uh, very off the rails so far. No, this is great. This is honestly what I wanted. Oh, he he making a liar out of you. Alex says I have all your books, Matt. Mm, I'm gonna need a picture and a timestamp, or it didn't happen, Alex. Yeah, hold <laughs> up, to, hold up today's newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> I kid, I kid. I love you, Alex. So we, I really do uh, want to keep hearing you guys' uh, comments and questions and stuff. But let's try and talk a little bit about uh, yeah, audio books, or we'll never get through this. Um, so, oh, well, actually we did talk about royalty share and paying up front. Yes. Uh, so I am glad we got into that. And that was one of the first questions I want to talk about. And, uh, should you read your own work or hire a professional and where does all this shit happen anyway? So, uh, just to clarify for you guys, um, and I, I hate to always do this, but I kind of have to just put my foot down at a certain point. Um, because yes, we know that Barnes and Nobles and Smashwords and Kindle and or not Kindle Kobo and all these different companies all have books. But basically, when we're talking about publishing books, we're talking about Amazon. Yeah. So I'm usually just going to cut right to the chase and say how it's done on Amazon. So Amazon has a sister website which is called ACX, and I think it's uh, audio the Audiobook Creator Exchange or something is what it stands for. I think that's yeah. So you go to acx.com. What you need to do is you need to have your completed manuscript. You go to acx.com and you put up. So you want to pick a section of your manuscript to get um, not rehearsals. What are they called? Uh, uh, all right. I'm blanking, I'm blanking on the word. Okay. <laughs> Auditions. <laughs> Audition. Okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you want to pick a section of your of your book to get auditions for. So there's, you know, a couple of ways that you can skin that cat. You can either pick the hardest section of your book. You can pick a section that you think uh, is going to give you the best um, feel for your narrators. Or you can just pick the first couple of pages. Um, so, for instance... The thing you want to bear in mind about narrators that I always want to bear in mind about narrators is if they're going to do the different voices and they're going to do them well. Right. So any any asshole, in my opinion, can pick up a book and just read it straight through and not do voices. But I kind of want to hear character voices. Right. And when I've been going through auditions, and I just went through about 75 auditions for Broken Down Heroes of the Western Night, and only about half of them did voices for the characters. And even the ones where I was like, 
he's good. I would listen to him through an audio book, but I'm like, it's going to get really monotonous and it's going to be really hard to tell who's talking. Right. Especially if you are like most modern writers and you don't put a dialogue tag after every piece of dialogue. So the dialogue tag being so-and-so Steven said, right. so-and-so said Matt. Um, if you're just having dialogue back and forth, you need some kind of differentiation or it's just going to all go in one ear and out the other. So pick something good for your audition, put it on ACX, advertise it on social media. You know, don't just sit back. Now you'll sit back and you'll wait and you will get some auditions, but if you advertise it to in general and to narrators in specific, so, like, first thing I did was, you know, I texted John Wayne Communale, and, uh, you know, he immediately ignored me. Um, but hopefully with, you know, better narrators than him, uh, they'll actually go out and, and take a swing at that audition for you. Um, so you're going to pick whether you want royalty share or pay up front. Put in the sample audition. Listen to your auditions. And then from one of those people, you're going to pick your narrator. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, Matt, um, that's basically where my knowledge of the audiobook generating process stops. Okay. So if something comes across your desk as an as a audio engineer i know you've done commercials um i know mm -hmm. you've done you know things like that um yeah in fact let's let's do that because i know that's kind of like more your um forte somebody hands you a script for a commercial what all is involved in you creating that i know it's only a 30 or 60 second spot but like what kind of equipment do you need and what kind of you know, what, what do you do with that exactly? So in the past, when I would do just those quick commercials that would get tagged at the beginning and the ends of like podcast episodes, um, usually we always ask somebody like, you know, keep it, keep it about 30 seconds long, but make sure you get all your points across. Make sure you have, you know, your name, title of the book, where it's all found, give a brief description of the book, you know, all the pinpoints, you know, you, you don't want to over fluff something like that. But for me on my end, I always make sure that I can go and find music for a background that fits the tone of what the person's trying to sell. And then I will do a read of it. Um, some, and, and some of the times it was me, sometimes Brian would do a read of it. Sometimes Mary would do a read of it, but um, you know, those take, those read takes could take several, even for a 30 second thing, you know, and that's why with, with some voice actors that do the uh, audio narration, my hat's off to them because I, <laughs> I've done things where I, I tried to record like a reading of myself just for a YouTube video, like reading a short, and I fuck it up multiple goddamn times. And I want to get that perfect read through. So, you know, with the commercials, that happens quite often where I have to retake and retake and retake and retake. But when you get something done and it's good, now, I guess if you want me to, I can go into the specifics of the uh, audio equipment that I use to render this stuff and everything. Um, so anybody who's wanted to know stuff like this, get now it's time to get your pen and pad out. Um, one of the audio uh, softwares that I use is called Audacity. You can get it for free. Um, I use it. I've used it since day one for an audio you know, editing software, it's probably the best thing out there, in my opinion. Um, you know, there's some high-end microphones you can buy that come with their own, but I I think they're trash compared to Audacity. So you get it, I, I'll have my Audacity, I'll load my audio in. Now, the problem that can run into this sometimes is that no matter how good of a microphone you have, the audio could be kind of quiet, you know, especially if you're starting out, because it, it's... It's taken me, it, you know, when, when I started doing podcasting, it took me about a year to get all the levels where I really wanted them, where it sounded good, you know, for even like a room that had a lot of echo to it. So if it comes in and it's too quiet, and this was something where I ended up helping Steve out uh, with one of his books, because he he messaged me and he's like, hey, you know, 
audio is great, but I just, I can't fucking hear any of it. And it's like at these low decibels. So m the trick up my sleeve for that is another little piece of audio equipment, a uh, software. It's called CN Levelator. I think it's called Levelator 2 or whatever. Again, free software. This thing, what it will do after you, you have your audio ready, you upload it into this and it will pick the peak decibel in your audio tr uh, in your audio track and it makes everything match that or at least gets it close enough that it's not clipping the audio because and that's that's something else down the line uh, clipping um so that will pretty much make everything crystal clear to the point where you know if there was somebody who was even whispering you'll be able to hear them or they're in like a room a side of you and they're still trying to talk to you for some stupid reason, you know, an extreme example, but it, it'll help you hear that person on the other side of a room. So you get that back in. Now, one thing that I like that everyone should do. Um, and I, I do this for all the ads. I do this for all the podcast stuff. Um, and I would imagine for an audio book, you definitely want to do this too. Um, you want to make sure any background noise, is gone. I mean, and like anything. And that can be different. That can be very difficult, but you can do it in audacity. Uh, you want to make sure that you do that before and after you send it through Levelator just to get everything completely out. Because nothing pulls anybody out of any good sounding podcast or anything. If between talking, you just hear it, it's terrible. And it, it there's some podcasts that I absolutely love. And uh, like after doing this for a while and I hear that, I just, I'm like, I can't, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> like it's great content, but it just drives me fucking bananas. So yeah. And then that's when that's all done. Um, you can, uh, I, I do things where I render it through, uh, there's graphic equalizers built straight into audacity where you can up treble, uh, lower treble, flatten baselines, you know, enhance baselines. Um, I've gotten it down to a science where, you know, and I should have, cause I've been doing this now for like eight, nine years. I've gotten it down to a science where most of these podcasts I can get done in like 20 minutes tops. So before it was taking me hours. <laughs> and if, if I was doing as many podcasts in the beginning as I was, you know, like a year or so ago when I was, when I had defenders, cosmic, horror uh, horror show grindcast and i was editing all of those at one point in time if i didn't know what the hell i was doing i wouldn't be able to have a full-time job and do and do editing for that as well it took me a long time in the beginning but yeah i i would say for for anybody who's starting out with the audio those two softwares are a godsend audacity and cn level later you must have those i i they're they will always be in my Swiss Army knife of things that I use for audio editing. Um, I don't. Do you want me to get into like microphones and stuff that I use, or? Um, I I do, but I wanted to ask what clipping was. Oh yeah, sorry. I did. I I I teased that and then I walked away from it. So clipping is um, when you're listening to any sort of audio and then like people, somebody screams or somebody laughs too loud and it it sounds like that. <laughs> Like it does like that noise where it's just so loud. All it does is crackle the audio or it muffles the voice because it, it's just, it's annoying as hell to deal with though. But with audacity, you're also able to lower that. There's a normalize function, which normalizing will take all of the peak decibels and it puts them down under a level where it, the uh, clipping no longer happens and it smooths out all the audio. So it sounds somewhat normal. There's only so much you can do. You know, because like with a raw audio file, if it's if it's really fucked from the get go, <laughs> there's only so much polishing a turd you can possibly right. do. But, you know, those those tricks I use with Audacity are about the best you can do to get your audio sounding really good. OK. Well, I don't know if you know this, Matt, but I'm actually all about that bass. Yeah, about that base. No treble. About that base. No treble. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, so regarding the microphones, and this is actually just like a no bullshit because I I always every once in a while I'm like I get a wild hair up my ass where I'm like you know I've got a pretty good I, I'm 
this is no bullshit either. I'm like, you know, I've got a pretty good voice. I'd love to pull out one of those old, like, uh, public domain, you know, stories like House on the Borderland or, you know, a right. Poe story or something and just record it just so I can, you know, have something out there. Maybe people buy it. Maybe they don't, but whatever. Um, so is this something that, like, could I do this with, like, this, you know, uh, headset that I have? Uh, could I do it with just my computer or do I, or do I really want to invest in a quality because I know, well, I guess it's a good thing where I have you. I know what, you know, all the narrators are going to be like, well, no, you've got to buy the top of the line, but buddy fucking boo. But like, do you really have to do that? Or is there like a, a happy medium where it's like, yeah, narrators need top of the line, whatever, but you could probably get away with this. I'd say if you're going to go into it where you're going to, where you want to do your own audiobook. And I, I wouldn't tell anybody to not do their own audiobook, just like with writing at the same time, you know. Um, if you have the gusto to give it a shot, give it a shot. But also know that the main part of audio is that you need to sound pleasing. As you've mentioned before, you were doing some of the audition run-throughs, and out of 70-some people, there was like, you know, a quarter of that actually was pleasing to you. So it's a it's a giant net and there's a lot of fish in the sea that this net tries to catch and you know unfortunately this fishing boat isn't very picky you know it's very very picky about its fish and it will throw most of it back that that's audiobooks um you know even with podcasting and i've met i just mentioned this earlier there's certain quirks with it that drive me nuts and i'll stop listening to a show because of it so with that in mind I don't, you don't need the top of the line, you know, and if, if, if any uh, voice acting engineers come along and see this down the road and then they want to tar and feather me and run me out of town, that's fine. You know, whatever you, <laughs> um, that, that's, that's your, that's your thing. You do it. But I, I don't, I personally don't believe you need top of the line stuff. There are very happy mediums. Um, that being said, though, I know a lot of people want to go with USB microphones because they are they're very easy to use. They're very user friendly. It's a plug in and you just go, it, you know, uh, Audacity that I mentioned, it syncs right up to most USB microphones. You don't have to fuck with anything and you, you, you know, it, you don't have as many options to uh, get your audio, you know, get your levels doing what you really want. But it still sounds fairly decent for the most part. Um, I'm using a Blue Yeti microphone right now uh, for this conversation that we're having. And I, I've had these for the podcast for a while. And they, they're, they're servable, serviceable. The only problem I will say with them is that they do age, you know, as most things do. But the condensers inside of these microphones after a while of being used weekly, sometimes multiple days weekly, um, they don't, they, they start not to working as well as they used to. So, you know, with that in mind and USB microphones, I, I don't, if you really want to have a good sounding audiobook, if that's something that's your, you know, your, your mission that you're setting out for, I wouldn't go with a USB microphone. I would definitely go with a, a straight wired in microphone, but you don't have to drop a shit ton of money to do that. You know, when a lot of people hear somebody say that, they're like, oh, Christ, here goes, you know, like a thousand dollars worth of dough. And, you know, I don't even know if I'll get this back from my book. You you would like a mixing board. You know, that, that's something you should have. I personally, I think if you want like top quality, um, a mixing board with a plugged in mic would be ideal. And the mic out there that's basically like an industry standard mic is a Shure SM57. That microphone is used for almost everything, like audio, like uh, for concerts, some uh, recording studios that do voiceover work with Disney and stuff like that. It's not even a very expensive microphone. It just does really well. So it's a microphone to look into. And since you only have one microphone, guess what? You only need a one or two channel mixing board, which can cost you 30 or $40. Oh. Okay. So most of all that stuff, you just plug in. It uses SD cards that slide in. You save your audio to it. You plop that into your computer and you're good. You got all your raw audio files right there. 
almost like it would have been if you just plugged in a USB microphone, but with better quality audio. So I don't have to get one of those big like wheels with the spinning with the holes in it and like that rolls like real tape. No, you don't need that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I would recommend a Rue Goldberg machine though. They, they help with. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, all told, and you were saying you don't have to break the bank and you could probably get a mixing board for 30 or 40 bucks. Um, yeah. And again, like eBay, honestly, I, I, and even Amazon has good deals on that stuff nowadays. But like, you know, if you're on a budget, just shop. You'll find what you want and not have to spend a whole ton of money. Could you give us a ballpark if I wanted to go from zero to audiobook recording next week? Am I talking like $200, $500? I wouldn't say $500. I, I'd say you're probably looking anywhere from like 100 to to two hundred dollars, probably to do like yeah. the area that I was mentioning, with like the uh, the hardwired in mic and like the shore mic and everything. I, I think you could pull that off for about a hundred to two hundred dollars. And then okay. guess what? You know that sounds like a lot, but then you're set. You have that for as long as you want to use it. Yeah, I was gonna say, and and like I was saying before, that's about what you could expect to spend on a finished hour from a professional narrator. Yeah. So if, if you're thinking of using, if you're thinking of doing your own books in the future, that might be worth investing. In. And again, <laughs> before you go out and blow the money, make sure you also have a good sounding voice. Ask some friends, you know, I, I like, like you said, you, you like, you think that you have a good voice and I would agree with you. You do have a good voice. I would listen to you read a book. I, on the other hand, don't think I have that kind of voice. And I sometimes don't even know how people stand listening to me on all the podcasts. Um, I, I wish I had, you know, buttery vocals. It's because you I, engineer it so perfectly. <laughs> it's practically like it's auto-tuned, you know? Maybe that's what I need. I need to get an auto-tuner software. But yeah, I, I, I would love to narrate my own books. I can do voices and stuff, but I don't think my normal voice uh, really cuts the mustard when it comes to that. So I would probably hire somebody else. Okay. And that's, uh, so this other question that I had, we, we basically just covered, I, I was saying, uh, what's to just stop me from just recording my book tomorrow? Um, which we basically talked about, you, you know, you probably could. Um, but since you brought it up and I'm not going to make you dance like a monkey because I honestly, <laughs> I'm getting to the point where I'm cringing when everybody's always like, Matt, do a voice, Matt, do a voice. Yeah. But I do want to talk a little bit about doing the impersonations or, or voices or whatever we want to uh, call it. Um, so, and again, I, I know we've said you, you haven't actually done an audio book, but you've done podcasts and, you know, clearly you've had to keep these voices up for, uh, you know, any period of time. <laughs> um, and we've mentioned before, so like, you know, the famously, you know, like George R. R. Martin's um, A Song of Ice and Fire has, like 5,000 characters. Like, I'm not exaggerating. Right. It's like like the guy that does the audiobook for that, he has to do like 5,000 theoretically different voices. I couldn't imagine that. Um, so, I, you, again, you may not know the answer to this necessarily, but uh, like this, this book I just did, uh, Broken Down Here, is basically there's three characters with three distinct voices. Mm -hmm. So if I was... The, if I was my narrator, which is a strange way to phrase this, <laughs> but what is my narrator doing when she does the voices? Is she, I, I'm assuming that she's not reading the narration, then doing voice number one, then reading the narration, then doing voice number two. Like, do you? Because there's also things where like you'll you'll blow out your voice if you do it all. You know, like if you if you have a particularly hard voice to do, you'll blow it out if you do it all at once and that kind of right, like, right. So, are you actually edit it? Like, do you do all the lines in the one voice and then you actually edit it back into the the um, podcast or, or audiobook, so to speak? That's an interesting question, actually. I I don't know. I I really don't know because that. I mean, wow. I never really thought about it that way before because I would imagine with with pros, they probably can go back in 
and reinsert voices later. Because you have a good point there. Like, if you keep doing a set of different voices for anywhere longer than probably an hour or even over 30 minutes, I would imagine you're going to get pretty hoarse <laughs> eventually. Like, your voice is going to start cracking. So, yeah, maybe they do. Maybe they do go back in and edit that in later. I mean, it would make sense, I, I guess, now that I'm thinking about it, because that would give you the best sounding audio instead of because because i know for me when i read over books i have like i i assign voices in my head to the characters when i while i'm reading and i've tried doing it out loud before like practicing and i just like i fumble because i i forget like the voice exactly that i want and i go back and it's just like oh <laughs> i do declare it it's like oh the darling. <laughs> like, so yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm maybe they do. Maybe they do edit it back in later. That would be an interesting thing. Like maybe uh, if we ever get the Stephen Pinchy back, yeah, voice writers, I'd have to ask him that question because that that was one I did not think of when he was there. Great guy, by the way. That was really fun talking to him. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad I, I hooked you guys up with him. Um, he did. Uh, well, he's most famous for doing the Duke on Karis Hell. Mm -hmm. But he's also an award nominated, uh, was it a voiceover arts award nominated narrator of uh, Brain Eater Jones. Ooh. Um, but yeah, I was glad to, I got to hook you guys up with him because he's, he's a great time. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Okay, so that's interesting. So would that be another, uh, and again, we're, we're all talking in theory at this point, but would that be another software program I would need if I had to cut? And paste, or can I do all that all over? No, you can drop in multi multi lines of audio within Audacity. Okay. So in theory, if I do it that way, where I um, record all all of one character's voice and then put it back in, I would still just need that same software suite. Yep, you can use the same one for that. It would just be, you know, I would leave myself cues in areas of where that's going to be dropped in, because you'll have to create. A part in the file where there's silence then so then when the alt when the second track goes in you can plop it where it needs to go um yeah you you could easily do that i mean and i've done with podcasts with with the podcast and stuff i've i've edited out audio before and rearranged it in a way to make somebody sound like they're saying something that they didn't <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I, it's, it's entirely possible it, it will just take a little bit I, I, like, again, all of this, just like writing, when you start, it just, you have to get familiar with it. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it, it, it's like riding the bike with training wheels. Eventually you can take them off and then you can just fly down the street and then crash, get up and crash again. But eventually you won't crash anymore, you know? So when you say cues, do you mean that I'm physically going to be like, my safe word is turn up. And then I go do, 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 do. turn up, stop. No, no, you don't have to do that. You how, do you, how do you do a cue? What do you mean by a cue? Um, I call them cues. I'm sure somebody else, I'm sure other audio technicians would call them something else, but I call them cues where you leave yourself at least three seconds of dead air. Cause when, when you leave at least that much time and you should also do it at the beginning of any recording. Leave yourself three seconds of dead air. That's just to get your background audio, like your background noise. So you have a spot to highlight it to tell Audacity what to delete through the rest of the track. But anytime when you know you want to insert something, leave yourself about three seconds. Because when that gets put into the software, you'll see each and every one of those little three second blips. There'll be just like a tiny little gap in all of your audio. And that's when you know, you're like, okay, there's the first voice I'm going to do. There's the second, there's the third. And it, it's just an easier way to plop them in without having to, you know, mentally remind yourself or listen through everything to find where that was going to be again. Well, I'm glad I asked then because then using a safe word would actually be counterproductive. It would just all <laughs> look the same on the. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Like you're not going to be able to identify where you say turn up. So you actually want a, a, a blank space. Yep. on the what do you call the chart is there a word for that uh the, i call it, uh, it just, just the decibel graph i would say decibel graph. okay interesting interesting um so we kind of talked about this before 
And uh, I will say you, you reminded me of something funny about that. But one of the questions I wanted to cover was what do you look for in a narrator or, or a sound engineer? And um, it was funny that you brought that up and said uh, probably 75% of what you listen to is not good. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. Because mm. uh, I remember guys that just did not get it. Right. And uh, like the, the one funny thing I always keep going back to, um, not to harp on anybody with particular accents, but Brain Eater Jones, it's clearly it's in like, chicago or you know an urban area with kind of a 30s like italians fast talking kind of vibe right right um it's like hey da, 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 you know like uh, you know humphrey bogart kind of thing and i just remember the one audition i got was this down home memphis voice oh, he's no. like brainy to jones woke up in the alley one day and i was like why did you even think this was going to be in your wheelhouse? Yeah. Like you should be doing Faulkner and shit, but I yeah. don't know why you auditioned for this. So that's, that's my story about that. But um, from a more professional standpoint, um, if you were listening to a bunch of auditions and stuff, like what kind of red flags and aside from the obvious, like, I can tell he doesn't get what I'm going for, which that's what ultimately that's what a lot of them were for me was just like, he doesn't get it. Uh, he or she doesn't get it. But mm -hmm. um, what, what kind of things would you look for if you were going through auditions for say an audiobook? Well, I guess, I guess the, the same thing I would do if I decide I'm sticking with a podcast or not, um, you know, just, for me, it it had the voice not only has to kind of fit the tone of what the book's gonna be, like you've mentioned, but at the same time, I feel it has to be a voice that I'm gonna be okay with spending God knows how many hours of my life with on this journey of finishing this book. You know, if if you're that person that's able to listen to audiobooks while you're working, like you can get an audiobook wrapped up in like, like a day, probably. Um but if you're like me and the only time you get to listen to audiobooks is when you're traveling back and forth from somewhere and that's only like 15 minutes, it's going to take you months <laughs> to get through an audiobook. And for me, yeah, like it it has to be a voice where it, it just like in a sense, like, and I don't know, it probably doesn't make any sense, but it, it has to like click with me. It has to be like that voice that like when it, you just hear them talking, whether it be female or a male voice where they just they they start reading and you're just you have that feeling of coziness a little bit you know where you're just like yeah like it's almost like mom and dad are reading me a story you know and it just feels it feels right and it feels comfortable and like it's pleasing to my ear to listen to because and I'll say there there are some Stephen King audiobooks I've listened to and and they get you know some of the top voice actors to do his books and there are. Uh, more than a handful of these audiobooks where I'm like, well, that was $25 wasted because <laughs> right. back when you had to buy them on CDs, you know, and I'm dating myself now, but you know, this was before uh, audible, you know, came around and you could be like, well, that sucks. I'll refund that and try to get my, my other free book this month. <laughs> you know um, I know one of the ones that stuck out to me the most, I think it was on a collection. I think it was Dolan's Cadillac. They had, the and, and this isn't against her at all, but they had the voice actor that voiced um Lisa Simpson. I can't remember, oh. her name, but they had her reading a story and not a bad voice, but when you know who it is, and that took me out of it, that, that it pulled me straight out. And when I'm hearing Lisa Simpson say like fuck and shit. And, you know, talking about like burying a man up to his neck and everything. I'm just like, I, I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> like, it's a great story, but I cannot listen to this person do it. So, and it, it's almost, it's that other thing too. Like you almost don't want something that's so familiar that it, it will pull you out of the experience. Like if, if, you know, if like, if Homer Simpson, even for that fact came in and started, and I don't think I could ever listen to Homer Simpson read a Stephen King book to me. You know, it would have to be a very short story, first of all. But like, yeah, if it's something that's too familiar, it just for me, it doesn't work. 
So I, I feel like you you need that great middle spot, which, like you said, 75% of the time is not going to happen. And it, it's just that small ratio of people. So, you know, plus I, I do like, I feel like with a, with a male reader, with a male na- a narrator, for some reason I gravitate more to a, a deeper toned voice. And that's just my earballs. That's what they like to hear, you know, more than anything. Like Steve from Pimsy, his his uh, Duke thing. When I was watching that movie, I was like, I don't really even care what the hell else is going on in this movie. This guy's lines are fucking great. Yeah. Like his reading for just that fucking unicorn. I'm like, I don't think he got paid enough to do this. <laughs> what he was doing, like he put his all into that role, and it was it, you could tell. And even just talking to him on the podcast, his normal voice, I'm like, you were born, you were handed down from the heavens to do this job. And he does very well. Um, I can't remember his the the actor's name, but um, I'm trying to think of like what he, what roles he played. Now, he was Goliath in uh, the Gargoyles cartoon. Oh, Keith David. Keith David, yes, thank you. I could listen to Keith David oh. read me anybody's grocery yeah. list. Like, it, it could be any grocery list. It could just be a fucking waste bin full of them. I would sit and listen to hours for to him read that stuff. And that that, hey. and you're not going to get Keith David to read your book, unfortunately. I like. I mean, maybe you could if you know the right people, but yeah, I think he's a little bit past that. Yeah, but that that's that's to me that's one of my gold standards. Like when you say like, what kind of a voice would you like to hear that? Like that wheelhouse is like so perfect. It just it like it wraps you in comfort. It's warming, and you're just like, man, just talk. You don't even need to read a book. Just talk to me. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, Keith David was at a uh, convention I did a couple of years ago, and one of the organizers was talking about having him do uh, voicemail messages. Mm. And I was like. Oh my God, I would pay a lot of money to have a voicemail message from Goliath, you know? Yeah. And they were like, nope, he wouldn't do it. And I'm like, you know, I don't blame him because he would <laughs> probably blow out his voice after three days of doing that. Yeah. Oh, Alexander Bailey says, I still regret not meeting Keith David at Scares a few years ago. Yeah, I, 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 I can't say I've met him. He seems like a very nice guy yeah um so you actually touched on an interesting point i uh wasn't thinking about when i wrote the rubric for this but i guess it was one of the things i thought might come up was uh male versus female Mm. which is something that i forgot about uh when we when i was doing the initial thing uh when you go on acx they do say do you have a preference for male narrator female narrator or no preference And um, I will tell you, so for instance, I I did Billy and the Clonosaurus, literally every character is a male. I'm like, I I had to say, you know, male. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's things I've done where it's like a first person perspective and maybe it's a female. And I'm like, I gotta, I gotta go with female on this. Right. Um, But I just had an interesting experience. I, I feel like, I almost feel like I'm plugging it at this point. But it's, it's actually literally just, it's what I am working on in the audiobook right now, which is why I keep harping back on it. But doing Broken Down Heroes of the Western Night, which is my last novel, it's going to be an audiobook sometime this year. Um, most of the characters are male. Mm-hmm. And I think there's maybe one character, I'm not even sure you'd call her major, uh, one female character. But even after listening to all the male narrators, my favorite was a female. And she said to me, she's like, I'm not going to audition. I'm like, no, no audition. I want to hear what you, what you do. Right. It's kind of like what you were talking about, Matt. Like she had that mellifluous, like, I'm like, I could listen to this voice all right. day. Um, do you think there's any, um, I know you, we could get into the politics of it, but that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm like, do you, do you think there's any, um, do you think it just boils down to that? Like, most of the characters are female, pick up female, or just whoever's best. Or, I mean, unfortunately, I, I feel like it kind of does boil down to that. And and like you you mentioned with this uh, this woman that read 
uh, read Broken Down Heroes and and you liked, there is that you know that exception. I mean, and, and it's I don't feel like just because they're mostly male characters that a woman can't read it. But at the same time, if if you're and again, I think that comes down to tone as well. If your book is geared more in the wheelhouse of it being like a male bravado driven story, it probably would be better to have a male voice read it, you know? Um, but that's not to say that a female couldn't do it either. So I don't know. I, I, I guess that, that really just boils down to preference, honestly, I guess at, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, if you're auditioning, it's what you want. To, it's what pleases you when you're hearing it. You know, I think I, I, I don't know. I would love, I would actually love to see a, a woman do a reading for a more male centered character book and then just knock it out of the park. I would love to see something like that happen. Cause I, I think that would just flatten a lot of people. It was like, I don't, you know, you, cause I, I can see that now, like people thinking like, Oh, I don't, how's this going to work? And it's it just be like, Holy shit. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> Well, you will on Broken Down Heroes of the Western Night is really yeah, I can't wait for that. I'll, I'll get that. <laughs> okay, so I think we covered just about anything, everything. The last question I had here, and this is kind of broad, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it is actually something I want to ask you about because I don't, I'm uh, this is not something I'm super familiar with. But um, so the question as written is. How are audiobooks different from podcasts, radio shows, other oral media? Okay. Um, which is uh, this is something that I that I wanted to get your perspective on. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever done explicitly a radio show where what I'm talking about is not not you know spanky in the butt of one of these. I mean, like a, a you know like a, a a script that has been written for radio. Okay, I, okay. I don't even I don't even know if they're called that anymore, but you know, like a radio play, like a, a, yeah. a an audio play, um, versus uh, okay, a podcast. It, it may be somewhat scripted, but it's supposed to be more naturalistic, right? And then an audio book, which is essentially translating a text that already exists. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm not expressing the question in a great way, but I'm. No, I, th I, I think I'm like, trying to say, <laughs> what are the different? What are the different? I guess you know pitfalls, and what are the things that you look for in these different kinds of media? Because that's one of those things where, if you were asking me, I like would not make that distinction. But talking mm -hmm. to a sound engineer, I'd be interested in your perspective. So I think, I think if we were to put these in tiers of like what probably is going to have the most demanding. Uh, excellence for its audio you're probably looking at audiobooks because they're a huge business right now uh like you've mentioned a radio play um i don't know many people that do them that much anymore they still exist they do still exist um but i feel like i feel like with radio even there's a little bit more of a leeway as to you know it sounding as best as it possibly could i i feel like you kind of get a little bit more of of a of an escape with that podcasts on the other hand there are so many varying degrees of people that either have no goddamn idea what the hell they're doing and people that you know really try and put in the time i i feel like with a podcast it it all boils down to now, now, for me, like I've said earlier, some podcasts with their audio takes me right out of it. But I also did say their show and the content that they're producing is still interesting. And I and that's with podcasts. I feel like a lot of people kind of do excuse some of the more guerrilla style or amateurishly done, uh, you know, productions because they just want to hear what these people are putting out because they it, it interests them and it grabs them, you know. So. I feel pod podcasts get a little bit more of a pass in this area. And, you know, I feel like if, if you want to reach that level of syndication someday where you could possibly be on the radio, and then, you know, you're like, this is WQXR FM with Spanky in the bud, you know, like <laughs> you could get there, but you're going to need to know what the hell you're doing. Um, you know, I, but 
with most radio stations, they have a bunch of people like me that sit in dark rooms and just edit audio all day. So <laughs> you might not have to know about it as much when you get to that level, but to get there, you, you might want to sink some of the time in, but yeah, I feel like an audiobook is the pinnacle to me personally of where you should hone your skill. If you're going to look at editing, you know, your own book and audio for a living essentially. Because, I, like I said, there, there are so many more audiobooks out there than there used to be. Because that, it, you know, much like books themselves, before self-publishing became a thing, you'd only get an audiobook through a major publishing house, for the most part. And, you know, I, I, I don't even, did they used to do them on eight tracks? Or was that when tapes came around that that started being a thing? <laughs> That's I'm before sure my time. I definitely remember them being on tape, though. Yeah. I know they were on tapes because I have some of them and it's like this giant tome of like 75 cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but those only used to be produced through major publishers because they had the capital to produce that, that sort of thing. And now that became, you know, the, the writing world in a sense became more of a wild West than it ever was before because anybody can put out an audio book. Anybody can write a book. Anybody can publish a book, but it's those people that put in that extra time and learn how to do it right that, you know, the cream rises to the top a little bit more. So I, I think, you know, audiobook is to me the pinnacle of where you should be doing most of your investment. You know, if, if that's where you're hoping to go with learning how to do audio, start with a podcast, learn how to speak publicly, learn how to try and speak fluently. Um, you know, get to a point where you're like me, where you ramble on and on and on. And sometimes you get tired of hearing yourself talk, but that's, that's a skill you need to learn too. So, you know, I, I, it, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it does. And actually you reminded me why I brought up that radio play thing. Um, because I know that audible, and again, I'm, I'm not right, quite sure what the right term is. I'm sure Audible has some kind of term for it, but like the they'll do things where it's very explicitly not an audiobook. Mm -hmm. Like they did a, a retelling of the um, the Alien Three uh, screenplay, like oh, a, yeah, a, yeah. an unpublished version. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it it was this uh, like before they finalized it, they had basically a whole different story for Alien Three. And somehow Audible got the rights to it and then produced it as essentially a radio play. And I've, I've listened to a couple of things like that, where it's more, it's clearly written for the audio world. I guess that's what I, why I was thinking of that. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I guess it's still a little bit obscure right now, but I, I think that might be coming back. I think that might be the next thing. It would be cool. Like that was, that was an era of entertainment that, you know, I, I was never, I was never raised in that era of entertainment, but you know, we always saw in some of the movies we grew up with, like the families gather around the radio, to listen to the radio. Yeah. They're, they're staring at the radio, listening to it. And I'm like, it's such a weird concept, but you know, like I get it. And I kind of, I always growing up, I was like, I wish something like that would come back. Cause that's kind of an interesting idea where you're just listening to a play being presented to you without any visuals. And you get all of your entertainment through the, you know, the voices and I, that's this is so cool i i really think it should come back i mean hell we got vinyls again so yeah <laughs> that's true all right well we've kept you for almost two hours now so i guess i will say if anybody's still in the chat let us have your final questions now um but otherwise i think i'll let you go um, unless there was there anything else you wanted to cover, I we'll, we'll do our plugs in a minute, but, uh, I'm, I'm, I think we covered a lot and I'm very happy that you had me on, man. I really appreciate this. Yeah, no, I'm really glad you could make it. Um, I did, I did look back when you, uh, I won't say you called me out, but you said you haven't done this in a year. And I was like, you know what I, what the last time I did this was, was during the insurrection. I, oh yeah interviewed wesley southern and we were just both looking at each other being like there's an insurrection you want to talk about books ah. 
So it was technically 2021 uh, when I did that. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but no, I, yeah, I haven't done this in almost a year. Uh, so I really, uh, I'm glad to bring it back with you. But uh, yeah, so unless we get any last minute uh, questions, that, oh, all right, there you go. Bill Fisher, super fast. What is your next release? Do it super fast. <laughs> I don't have one currently. <laughs> Working on a bunch of projects. Hopefully the the next thing that pops out the door might be a novelette called uh, The Back Rooms. Uh, I think my next release will be Clickers Never Die in uh, wide release. There you go. Much Here's hoping. Than what I just got. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, Alexander says, thank you guys for doing this. It was very informative. And I was able to get some writing done while listening. That sounds like bullshit. That sounds like he wasn't really listening. Yeah. I, what? How could you have done both? That was. You, you two just faded into the background so easily. I could you know concentrate what? on something else entirely. You know what? Your, your flesh isn't even worth my name scribed on it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh bill says awesome thank you both very much okay well great. thank you for listening bill um so yeah uh if anybody wanted to find out more about you here's some of your podcasts so you mentioned um let me see if we can if we can go over them all so cosmic shenanigans is retired yeah i believe currently brian is moving all of the old audio from cosmic shenanigans and the horror show over to youtube well, are they, are they making new Cosmic Shenanigans? I don't believe so. I think her idea for that, and I, and I don't want to speak on her behalf, but from what I remember her saying, I believe she is going to start doing a blog for Cosmic. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So Cosmic Shenanigans is retired. Horror Show is retired. Ghost Writers Podcast is still active. Yep, so far. <laughs> Defenders Dialogue is still active. Yes, but they're they're wrapping up. I think they're going to 150 episodes, if I'm correct, and then that's going to end that. Okay. And Grindcast is still active. Yep. And what else am I forgetting? I think that's it as far as podcasts go. Okay. Um, so what else have you got out there that uh, folks can buy and pick up? Well, if you would like to buy any of my currently eight published books that i have just search my name you can see it right there at the bottom of my my stupid face uh just put that in on amazon and all the books that i have on offer will pop up and uh, you know if you buy one at all i thank you very much for your purchase and um you know uh if you're also an author and uh, you're starting out and you need some cover work done i'm currently doing cover work as well uh i've pretty good rates i i would think and um you know i get done pretty quickly with the work so i can meet your schedule you have a website for that or i have no websites yet <laughs> i know it's something i should have but i have no websites yet because i'm that unprofessional <laughs> okay well uh they can send up a signal flare or a semaphore i guess to uh yeah just just shoot a flare into the sky and i'm well, like just oh. uh dm you on twitter or something yeah yeah that would be you know what that's that's probably a more rational way to go about it okay. steve thank you <laughs> okay um you can reach out to me on twitter at matt underscore wilderson if you were interested in any of those things i talked about i did want to ask you briefly um so the new one baggage that mm -hmm. was a uh collaboration right yep that was a collaboration a good friend of mine simon paul wilson uh, so we had a blast writing that book What's the uh, concept? And I mean, just real quick. And how did you guys come to work on that together? So uh, the concept, the baggage, it was it was Simon's idea, but it boils down to um, a bunch of demon hunters, essentially, that get wrapped up in some really bad business, and it gets very very bloody and very violent. And uh, the main character that I wrote is a man who's on the edge of his ropes because he recently lost his wife to the job of demon hunting, which he's you know, damned to do for the rest of his life because it's all he knows. And, uh, you know, the other three people that are uh, 
Simon's characters that he created, they're also tied into this whole demon hunting thing through uh, curses, essentially. And, you know, they all come to a head one day and they find out that they have to rid the world of this evil that was said to not be able to be destroyed in order to break their bonds of all of the things that are holding them down and finally find peace in life. So it's, it was a, it was a crazy, crazy ride right in that book. And there are some extremely bloody parts, some extremely violent stuff. I channeled, uh, I channeled doom eternal music when I was writing some of those action scenes. And, um, um, for those of you out there who might not have grabbed the book or were wondering, uh, the character Zeb in the book is based off of Brian Keane. And my character punches and breaks his nose several times in the stories. So <laughs> I had a blast breaking Brian's nose several times. I can only imagine. <laughs> All right. So I mentioned it a couple of times uh, on this podcast or whatever the hell we're calling this on this Live stream? Vid live stream. Yeah. Uh, uh, my last release was Broken Down Heroes of the Western Night. That's a bit of a departure. Not horror or science fiction, but if you like my uh, voice, you'll like that. If you don't feel like a departure, um, I guess the last thing before that, uh, Slash Viber just was re-released. Um, check that out. That's my collaboration with Stevie Copas. Um, and... You can find me, if you can spell it right, you can probably find me online. I'm pretty much the only one there is, uh, aside from the relatives in Argentina and shit that I'm discovering every day. <laughs> but uh, Alexander Bailey wants you to know what a badass he is before we go. Well, that's subjective. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, thanks so much for coming on, Matt. And yeah, Thank uh, you so much for having me, man. Okay. Thanks, everybody. See ya. <laughs>